Welcome back to Ancient Military History and part two of our two-part special covering Gaius Julius Caesar IV. Be sure to watch part one so you're not missing out on some fun historical education about the ambitious Roman politician. So far we've learned that Caesar was an ambitious military and political leader, but you'll find out in this video that he and his legacy can be ascribed to much more than just war, conquest, and politics. So let's dive back in to our list of 20 facts about Rome's infamous dictator. Number 11. Religion. We can't talk about Caesar without mentioning the important role religion had in his life. In our last video, we talked about how he became the high priest of Jupiter at the age of 16. Years later, in 63 BC, Caesar was elected, largely due to bribes, as Pontifex Maximus, which was the highest priest in the Roman religion, and he held that position until his death. His main duty as high priest was to maintain peace of the gods and administer the Roman divine law. Having this position granted Caesar the power to regulate ceremonies and worship. He oversaw the construction of a new temple and dedicated it to the goddess Venus, from whom his family supposedly descended. Lastly, two years after his death, Caesar became the first Roman figure to be deified, and he posthumously received the title the Divine Julius. By 29 BC, the Emperor Augustus had erected the Temple of Caesar, which is also called the Temple of the Comet Star. It is said that a comet, which was a divine symbol in the Roman religion, had appeared not long after Caesar died. People believed that this star signified the soul of Caesar being received among the gods. Number 12. Multiple Love Affairs One of Caesar's most amazing characteristics is his energy, intellectually and physically, which he retained even later in life. Caesar's physical vitality probably explains his sexual promiscuity, which was out of the ordinary even by Greek and Roman standards. His love life can be described as complicated. His first wife was Cornelia, whom he married when he was a teenager, and she sadly died when he was but a young politician. He was then briefly wed to Pompeia, the granddaughter of the former dictator Sulla and most likely a distant cousin of Pompey the Great. However, after a few years, a scandal ensued when she was implicated with another man. Whether or not she had actually committed any offense, Caesar decided to divorce her. This gave rise to the proverb, Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. His third and final wife was Calpurnia, and they remained married until his death. Despite being married, however, there is no doubt that Caesar had multiple love affairs, hetero and homosexual, which he looked upon as trivial recreations. Supposedly, he also spent a large amount of money, public money, on prostitutes, and it was even rumored that he had relations with the King Nicomedes in his youth. Number 13. Cleopatra Caesar's most scandalous and infamous love affair was with Cleopatra VII, who co-ruled Egypt with her brother and husband, Ptolemy XIII. Egypt had its own power struggles, and Cleopatra had lived in exile in Syria by the time Pompey the Great absconded to Egypt after his loss at Pharsalus in 48 BC. News of the Battle of Pharsalus had quickly reached the Egyptians, and they believed that the gods favored Caesar over Pompey. Ptolemy, in hopes to gain an alliance with Caesar, had Pompey murdered as he stepped onto the shore. However, Caesar was greatly angered by this outcome, and he occupied Egypt and declared martial law. Ptolemy fled, and Cleopatra took the opportunity to smuggle herself back home. According to some accounts, she had rolled herself up in a rug or bag that was brought to Caesar. The historian Plutarch wrote, This little trick of Cleopatra's, which first showed her provocative impudence, is said to have been the first thing about her which captivated Caesar. They became lovers shortly after meeting, and they remained lovers until his death. The next year in 47 BC, Cleopatra gave birth to a son, and they named him Ptolemy Caesar. His nickname was Caesarian, or Little Caesar, and he was named heir to the Egyptian throne. Caesar once again became a figure of controversy when he allowed Cleopatra to visit him in Rome, which taxlessly flaunted the affair and resultingly upset not just the Senate but the public as well. Roman law was strictly against polygamy, and he was still married to Calpurnia. Romans allowed relations outside of marriage, as long as it wasn't humiliating to society and was carried out in a discreet manner. Furthermore, it did not help that the Romans were no fan of Cleopatra either. 
However, while Roman propriety and law dictated they keep a lower profile, Caesar and Cleopatra continued to appear in public together. Most upsetting to the public was Caesar's dedication of the temple to Venus. When he revealed the statue of the goddess, she very much resembled Cleopatra. Being the goddess of marriage, this would have been a slap in the face of his wife Calpurnia. Number 14. The Julian Calendar His relationship with Cleopatra had its benefits, the most important of which was the creation and implementation of a new calendar. For centuries, the Romans used a calendar that was based on the lunar cycle, and it only had 355 days. Roman officials had to add the extra 10 days to the year at their discretion, and so time could be manipulated for political purposes, such as extending their terms in office. Fed up with an inaccurate calendar and having the power as high priest to make the necessary changes, Caesar teamed up with Cleopatra's astronomers, who helped him create the Julian calendar. It had 365 days and a leap year. This calendar was widely used until 1582, when Pope Gregory XIII had to make a slight modification because the Julian calendar was off by 11 minutes. For example, this video was recorded on July 14th of 2021, but in Julian time, today is actually July 1st. Bonus fact. Caesar was born in the month of Quintilis, and after his death, the consul Mark Antony changed the name of the month to July to honor the late dictator. The subsequent month of Sextilis was renamed to August after his adopted son and successor, Augustus Caesar. Number 15. He was an excellent writer. Aside from having notoriously eloquent public speaking skills, Caesar was also an excellent writer and had numerous publications. He wrote books, speeches, and poems, but all of these publications have been lost to time and medieval historians who deemed them unimportant. Only his accounts of the Gallic Wars and Civil War survive, but those who remember his writings and speeches have noted that they apparently served political purposes, as all of his accounts are written in the form of dry, factual reports that look objective, but every recorded fact was carefully selected in his favor. Even his eulogy at his wife's funeral was political propaganda. However, despite being political, his publications have still been described as outstanding literary works of art, and in another display of his amazing energy, he managed to write his seven books on the Gallic Wars while still managing revolts in Gaul, and he wrote his book on the Civil War in the midst of the chaos that had ensued after defeating Pompey and becoming a dictator. Number 16. Caesar may have suffered from seizures. Caesar likely had epilepsy on the basis on four attacks that he notably suffered throughout his life. The first happened while listening to an oration by Cicero. His body started to tremble, and some of the papers he held dropped out of his hands. Second, in the Senate, while being offered the dictator's crown, he scandalously remained seated instead of standing to receive the honor. Historians state that his senses did not remain steady and he was speedily shaken and whirled about. Third, Plutarch wrote that Caesar had an epileptic seizure in the midst of the fighting during the Battle of Thaspis. And fourth, it is said he collapsed while on a campaign in Spain. It's possible that he had absence attacks as a child and teenager, and some historians believe that his child, Little Caesar, had his first seizure at the age of three. This suggests that the causes of the epileptic attacks could be genetic and would explain his father's sudden death in his youth. However, after re-examining the ancient historical accounts, the Imperial College London argue that Caesar may have actually been afflicted by cerebrovascular disease and had suffered from many strokes instead. Plutarch may have called it epilepsy, but other ancient historians mentioned weakness in the limbs, dizziness, and headaches as well. Because Caesar was known for his physical toughness, the sudden onset of these symptoms later in life would instead suggest a stroke or perhaps a heart attack. Lastly, others believe that Caesar had possibly faked or played up his symptoms because ancient Romans believed that seizures caused by epilepsy were a sign of divine possession. Number 17. The Resurrection of Devastated Cities Throughout ancient history, many cities had succumbed to Roman conquest and had become desolate territories annexed into the Roman Republic. While some cities were completely burned to the ground, inhabitants of others were captured and enslaved. 
Later in Caesar's life, the dictator resurrected the devastated cities by recolonizing them with Roman soldiers and Rome's lowest economic and social classes. The most significant cities he rebuilt were Carthage, Capua, and Corinth. Carthage grew to be the second largest city in the Western Roman Empire and became a center of early Christianity. In Capua, he built the Amphitheater of Capua, which was second only in size to the Colosseum in Rome. In Corinth, the city flourished to become the capital of the Roman province of Achaia, and it too was a very important city in early Christianity. Hitting two birds with one stone, Caesar's refounding of the conquered cities helped them grow into Rome's largest and most important economic hubs and it also provided a home for his displaced veterans and homeless poor. Number 18. Caesar's Currency Gold coins were relatively uncommon in this period of Roman history. Currency in ancient Rome was minted in bronze or silver, and gold was used in times of emergency. Coinage and mints were controlled by the Senate, but by the first century BC, campaigning generals began to operate mints themselves so they could pay their troops in the field. In 46 BC, Caesar ransacked the state reserves, took control of the coinage, and minted the largest quantity of gold coins ever seen in Rome, and without permission from the official Roman moneyers. He was also the first Roman politician to strike coins with his own portrait, which was a generally unacceptable act of political arrogance, as all previous coins had the portraits of ancestors, gods, important religious symbols, or animals. Later on, his adopted son and successor Augustus followed suit, and he struck coins in his likeness as well. In the later years of Caesar's life, he continued to mint new coins in silver and copper-zinc alloys, and they were minted with either a wreathed portrait to symbolize his established power and authority, or with the title Dictator for Life, or even a portrayal of him wearing the High Priest's Veil to proudly show off his supreme religious authority. Number 19. Death Beware the Ides of March Caesar's political reform was not without consequence. Many of his policies opposed the establishment and ideals of the Optimates. Furthermore, while his time as dictator is generally regarded as prosperous for Rome, the Senate had feared that he was becoming too powerful. The ranks of the Senate had been severely depleted, and Caesar appointed new members of his own partisans, which robbed the senatorial aristocracy of its prestige and made the Senate more subservient to him. Many feared that he would abolish the Senate altogether, which would give him absolute rule as king. As many as 60 senators, which included Optimates and former supporters of Caesar, who also feared his increasing monarchical power all conspired to end his life, with the belief that his death would lead to the restoration of the traditional Roman Republic. On March 15, 44 BC, also known as the Ides of March, Caesar was stabbed 23 times and died at the feet of a statue of Pompey. However, his death produced the opposite of what the Senate had hoped to achieve. The assassination made him a martyr and it incited another 13 years of civil war, resulting in the end of the Republic and the rise of the Roman Empire. Bonus fact, the Ides in the ancient Roman calendar roughly meant the middle of each month and was a sacred day for Jupiter, the king of gods. On the Ides of March specifically, a sacrificial lamb was offered to the god king. The Ides of each month were also designated days for settling one's debt. The fact that his assassins chose to murder him on the Ides of March may have been pure coincidence, or perhaps it was a symbolic gesture sacrifice Caesar to Jupiter, and reclaim the Republic at the price of his life. Number 20. His Legacy While the barbarians of the Gallic tribes would have remembered Caesar as the brutal, ambitious, and unrelenting conqueror of Gaul, the dictator made quite an impression that would last into the imperial days of Rome and even to this day. Some of the drastic governmental changes that benefited Rome's lower and middle class included the regulation of the distribution of subsidized grain, increasing the size of the Senate to represent more people, the reduction of government debt, granting citizenship to people in all of Rome's territories, which was a major point of contention and reason for rebellion in previous years, and reforming the Roman tax codes. Most importantly, he helped transform the long-established oligarchy into an autocracy that could never be abolished afterwards. As the German historian Theodor Mommsen elegantly put it, 
Caesar had swept away the pieces of a corrupt nobility and had created an empire that served the needs of all of its inhabitants. Thank you for watching Ancient Military History and 20 Interesting Facts About Julius Caesar. Did any of these facts surprise you, amaze you, or change your mind about the Roman dictator? Let us know in the comments below. And also let us know which ancient military leader you'd like to learn about next. If you liked this video and would like to see more, subscribe to the channel and check out our playlist of videos where we cover other interesting and influential military leaders. Until next time, thank you and have a wonderful day.